Hello and welcome to this talk on building better AAA mobile games with adaptive performance from Unity and Samsung. My name is Lewis Gordon and I work on Samsung's Galaxy Game Dev team. Our role is to help game developers get the best out of our phones and tablets. I will be talking about why Samsung and Unity join forces to work on adaptive performance and later on David Berger from Unity will talk in more detail about how adaptive performance works inside Unity. My background is as a AAA games developer, having started out at Argonaut Games in the 90s and also having worked at Rockstar and Konami. As I mentioned, this talk has two parts. Firstly, I will give a description of what adaptive performance is and why it is needed. Next, I'll talk about how the OS can help with this and in particular the API Samsung has added to our devices, Game SDK. I'll also give a real-world example of where Samsung has worked with a game developer to incorporate adaptive performance. Then I'll hand over to David to talk about adaptive performance in detail. So to kick off, what is adaptive performance? Simply put, it is a way to adjust the performance of your game while the game is running in response to external factors. When we make a game, particularly a AAA game, we try to get the maximum performance out of the device it is running on to show the game at its best. This can be done through better code, better assets, or more often a combination of the two. Sometimes compromises need to be made. Often the compromises are around getting a stable frame rate. A high FPS is a good thing to have, but in a lot of ways a stable frame rate is more important. In order to get the maximum performance as a programmer, you want as much control over the platform as possible. But not everything is directly under your control. In the next slides, I'll talk briefly about some of the different platforms and how they add complexity to getting the best performance. Console is probably the easiest platform to optimize for. The platform itself is fixed. All of the hardware is the same, or with a limited number of variations. There is no OS getting in the way. And there are no competing apps running in the background, stealing CPU cycles. You might have some simple settings for controls of volume, but nothing related to performance. You can optimize directly for the hardware and get good stability. PC is a harder proposition. Pretty much every PC is different because you can mix and match the hardware. You also have a heavyweight OS handling all of the resources and any hardware will be hidden behind APIs. There can also be other applications running in the background the user wants to compress a movie while playing your game, they can. This leads to a vast amount of settings for the player to tweak to get the best experience. Once the correct options have been selected though, you can get a stable frame rate. Mobile is in many ways similar to PC. People describe the mobile space as fragmented, but arguably it is simpler than PC. There are a finite, but ever increasing number of devices to target. There is still a pretty heavyweight OS in charge of things, and hardware is accessed through APIs. There is probably less competition from other processes, generally the foreground app will get the majority of the resources. Although many games do have performance settings, users expect the game to handle these automatically. The extra dimension to mobile is the effect of power consumption, and this is what can affect stability. Power consumption is the additional constraint in the mobile space. And it affects your game in two ways. It drains the battery, which can truncate play sessions, and it generates heat, which without mitigation can make the device too hot for comfort. Neither of these problems affect console and PC, although power limits are starting to appear, so maybe this won't be the case forever. But in mobile, the OS needs to do a couple of things to work around these problems. Firstly, it will try to save power at all times. It monitors CPU and GPU load, and reduces the clock frequencies as much as possible without impacting frame rate. Secondly, it will intervene if the device gets too hot. Here it will actively reduce clock frequencies below the levels required for a stable frame rate in order to keep the device comfortable. This is where you as the game developer need to think about how to respond. You still want to be able to use maximum performance where possible to show off your game, particularly when a player is playing for the first time, but frame rate stability is no less important, so you need to be able to reduce the CPU and GPU loads before the OS decides to throttle your game. This is what we mean by adaptive performance, scaling the game features to control thermal load and keep a stable frame rate. 
It's worth noting that it's peak clock frequencies that are the least efficient for power consumption because they require higher voltages. And there isn't a linear relationship between the performance gained by higher frequencies and the power used, so you may not have to reduce the load as much as you think. The graph here shows what the OS will do by default if a game doesn't try to reduce its load over time. As you can see, the game is fine for around 2 minutes until the temperature hits a certain level. After this point, the OS will reduce the CPU and GPU frequency to reduce the power used and the heat generated. Initially, this doesn't affect frame rate, but once past a certain point, frame rate begins to drop until it reaches a new stable point. What we wanted to do with Game SDK was to give game developers more control over how power is managed. First of all, we give more detailed information about the temperature state and flag when the game needs to take action. Secondly, we allow the game to have more control over the CPU and GPU frequencies. It's still important to keep these as low as possible to extend battery life. Thirdly, we provide more information about frame timing to help understand where the bottlenecks are. Previously, when we've talked about Game SDK, it was only available on the S10 and Note 10, but now it can be found on a much wider range of devices. The first part of the API for temperature is a warning level to let you know about any significant changes in the temperature. You register to get a callback from the API. The main part of the graph here is frame rate against time, and the dotted line is an indication of the temperature. When a game starts, the device will most likely be at a low temperature where peak performance can be used if needed, warning level zero here. In the graph, the game is continuing to use a lot of power, and the device heats up until it gets to a certain level and the API goes to warning level one. This means that throttling is imminent if nothing changes. At this point, you should start to make changes to the CPU and GPU load to prevent the device from getting hotter and triggering level 2. At level 2, Game SDK will start to throttle the CPU and GPU to get the temperature under control, and you can see that the stability suffers. This is what you want to avoid. It is much better for the game to make changes to reduce the load in order to, main st in order to maintain stability than to let Game SDK do it. We provide a number of functions to monitor temperature. The most useful is probably this high precision call doesn't provide an absolute temperature, but an abstracted level around the key temperature points. Zero means the device is at a cool enough value not to worry about, and this covers any temperature below that value as well. It may take a while to move above zero. Five is roughly the point at which you would get a throttling imminent warning. This is when you want to take action. Monitoring this value allows you to check the temperature trend, whether the device is heating up or cooling down. Ideally, by reducing the CPU and GPU load, the kernel will lower the CPU and GPU frequencies to match. We also provide a function so that you can control the maximum frequencies at any point in your game. The kernel can still go lower than you have requested, but it won't go higher. Note that this function returns a success or failure code. If you've already let the device get too hot, it may not be able to honor your request immediately. The final information you need is timing information to know which part of the system is doing the most work. You can measure the CPU timing from inside your main loop. For GPU timing, we provide an extra API call to get the time of the last completed frame. By comparing these to the target frame time, you can adjust CPU or GPU levels or scale game features to prevent throttling. Adaptive Performance Inside Unity uses all of these parts of the API to help you control how your game scales dynamically to maintain frame rate stability. Now I'll talk briefly about a real-world example of how adaptive performance has benefited a recent title. Samsung worked with Riot Games to add adaptive performance to League of Legends Wild Rift. This was done with a modified adaptive performance controller for extra flexibility, but it works in a very similar way to the standard controller. This is a flowchart of how adaptive performance works in Wild Rift. You'll see that the initial check is to see whether the game is running at the target frame rate. If it is, then the G CPU and GPU levels can be lowered, or if necessary, the dynamic features can be increased. If not, then a check is made for whether the CPU or GPU is the bottleneck, and the CPU or GPU levels are increased as appropriate. Or if the device is above a certain temperature, then some of the dynamic features are reduced. For the dynamic features, most are custom to Wild Rift, Things like level of detail for characters and also shadow detail. All were checked with the game team to make sure that the quality changes were acceptable. The results from this collaboration were an improvement in stability from around 75% to around 
Now I'm going to hand over to David to talk about how adaptive performance works inside Unity. Thanks, Luis. That was great. Believing in optimization by default and that we can help developers to achieve the goals of better performance with longer gameplay is one of our top priorities at Unity. That's one of the many reasons why we did partner up with Samsung in the last three years to develop adaptive performance alongside the game SDK to make the optimizations we develop more widely available to Unity users. A little bit about me. I'm David Berger, engineer at Unity Technologies, working in the Innovations Partners team on improving engine performance and bringing new exciting technologies to Unity. I've been optimizing many, many Unity projects from simpler games to AAA productions and spent a lot of time optimizing Unity source in the last seven years at Unity. Today, I'm gonna talk to you about adaptive performance, which hopefully also helps you to scale your content made in Unity flawlessly based on the device performance. As we heard earlier, developers cannot control temperature throttling and frequency scaling, but Samsung enables us on their phones to do exactly that. And that's where adaptive performance hooks into. The life cycle looks similar to this example. There is a problem detection, example, overheating of components through throttling events. Then there is a source identification through the temperature trends and CPU, GPU timing for bottleneck detection. And eventually there is a correction by changing the bottleneck load to decrease temperature. Let's look at the typical thermal throttling situation. Initially, a game works fine at 30 FPS, but not long after, the FPS is fluctuating widely and moves to 20 FPS over time. In the beginning, a high core frequency is used, which increases the temperature of the device rapidly, and thermal throttling occurs, which causes a drop in performance. So how can we solve this problem? And does adaptive performance actually work? Yes. In red, or the trend down, we see the frame rate of the Mega City demo before adding adaptive performance. But now, see the blue line. This is with adaptive performance added to the game, stable at 30 FPS for a much longer time. Even after we are arriving at the most busy part of the demo, we still do not tank the performance and stay quite stable. This not only gives us a more pleasant player experience, but also saves power and lets you play longer as battery isn't drained too much. To make it easier for Unity developers, we provide now temperature trend, level and warning APIs. We do not offer CPU and GPU junction temperature at this point, as it's less informative for the developer and compared to a trend line or a bottleneck detection, it's less useful. Now, one of the biggest issues in games is to know if one is CPU, GPU or target frame rate bound and what to scale to improve the thermal and overall performance situation. Knowing the total time of a frame and either CPU or GPU time enables us to determine if a game is more likely heavy on the CPU, GPU or actually meeting the target frame rate. Getting precise information from the game SDK about GPU time makes the decision easier based on the total frame time Unity spends working on a frame. So now it's possible to dial back CPU or GPU time respectively. But what else can be done to help adjusting game quality without adjusting actual content? To extend battery life, reducing core frequency is a way. And by doing so, it will work towards avoiding thermal buildup. Imagine a menu scene where not much is happening. Being able to reduce the core frequency will reduce thermal buildup and save battery, and the player is able to play the game longer. While moving to a CPU or GPU heavy area, it's possible to increase its frequency. And if thermal gets too high, it can be reduced as one of the ways to avoid thermal. To make this possible, there is a CPU-GPU level control available in adaptive performance, which can change CPU-GPU between three different levels. Additionally to performance levels, Adaptive Performance 2.2 also introduces CPU and GPU boost modes, which sets the maximum and minimum frequency to a maximum, to boost the CPU or GPU for 15 seconds. In this example, with increased workload, the CPU 4 to 7, our big cores, have increased frequency while boost mode is active. Tiny cores, 0 to 4, are not affected, as they are not used by Unity massively and do not need to be boosted. If you boost the CPU, GPU, and it's not required, the system will not increase the frequency. 
If an application switches to a new scene and you know it will be CPU or GPU bound, you can let the system know that it will need additional resources and it can boost the CPU and GPU. This will decrease the battery life heavily and can lead to serious throttling if misused and should be really treated carefully. One additional feature Adaptive Performance offers is the automatic performance control. It uses the bottleneck detection, temperature trend and CPU-GPU levels to automatically control performance of the application in a feedback loop process and is automatically enabled when you install Adaptive Performance. Adaptive Performance comes with the indexer. It generates a thermal and performance state action, increase, decrease, fast decrease, stale, to represent the current state of the device. It also knows of all scalars and receives their cost. Based on that data, it can quantify the state of the device and can notify each scalar to take appropriate action. Each scalar registers itself with the indexer to receive increase, decrease quality callbacks. The indexer applies and unapplies scalars based on the cost defined by the visual impact, high, mid, low, and the scalar target, CPU, GPU, fill rate mount. Once the indexer tells the scalar to either decrease the quality to improve performance and lower temperature, or to increase the quality if there is headroom available, the scalar then can scale its assigned feature to reduce and increase payload. Each feature has a minimum and a maximum scale, and the scaler can now change the quality for that feature dynamically in between that range. The range can be quantified by the maximum levels. Currently, we have several scalers available, each accompanied by a separate sample. Adaptive frame rate to control frame rate automatically, adaptive resolution for changes of the screen resolution, different adaptive shadow scalers, such as shadow map resolution, shadow distance, shadow quality or shadow cascades, adaptive LOD, which will change the LOD distance, adaptive view distance, which lowers the view distance if there is less resources available and increases view distance if there is plenty of processing power available. There can be any amount of scalers active at the same time and adaptive performance will constantly regulate them to adapt the content quality based on the thermal performance. You can easily create your own scalers. There is no limit of what can be scaled. There are more components in research at the moment to scale more engine features automatically in future. To verify results, Adaptive Performance comes with the profile integration in Unity 2021.2. It shows runtime information for Adaptive Performance, CPU, GPU times, frequency levels, bottlenecks, thermal warnings, and the status of each available scaler. Adaptive Performance also provides a device simulator extension, which lets you use all features in the editor without the need to deploy anything to the device for fast iteration time and prototyping. Adaptive Performance is used by a significant amount of games, such as Call of Duty Mobile, League of Legends Wild Rift, Shadowgun, Seven Deadly Sins, Genji Impact, and many more and shows in many cases how successful our tools for performance optimizations are, and we are looking forward to hear your success story as well. If you run your own SOC or simply want to create your own data provider to use adaptive performance features, there is only a minimum set of APIs required to be up and running in no time, depending on the needs of your target audience. A temperature level and or a temperature trend warning levels to estimate throttling if not supplied directly, a GPU frame time to predict bottlenecks properly, and an interface to set CPU and GPU frequency. There are several resources available to complement the official documentation, which can be helpful during development. Please feel free to also pass by our forum and give us feedback. So that's it from me today. Louis and me are more than happy to answer any questions via email, so please reach out. Thanks for listening.